Um, thanks so much for being here, and a uh, big thank you to Fulbright Chile for, for the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to be talking about grid stabilization. Uh, my name's Eric. I use he, him. And like Sophia, I went to Carleton College, where I studied physics. Um, and then spent the last three years working in California at the uh, California ISO, which is the electricity grid operator. Okay, so just to say my project in brief, so I'm going to be working with the professor at the University of Chile, uh, Claudia Raman. And Claudia Raman is leading a project to create a tool that will identify weaker areas of Chile's electricity grid and find an optimal solution to stabilize them. Um, and my specific area of interest is how battery storage is modeled within the tool. Um, we have a lot of battery storage in California, and I'm really excited to kind of exchange knowledge with Professor Raman and, and learn about um, her modeling efforts. Um, so I don't know if this means a whole lot just in two sentence form. So first and most of what I want to talk about is the context and motivation for the project. Um, so you might be wondering why is electric grid stability a concern? Um, what does it even mean to have a weak area of the grid? Um, and how do we improve stability? Um, but before I get into that, um, we want to start like a few steps back, and I'm sure a place where everyone is familiar in today's reality with climate change. Um, and as we can see, the share of global uh, carbon emissions by sector um, really is taken up a lot by the power industry. And so it's pretty clear that the power sector needs to, to decarbonize rapidly um, if we're going to meet our climate goals. And so with this in mind, Chile has set uh, an ambitious goal of converting 70% of its total energy consumption to renewables by 2030 and pledged to become carbon neutral by 2050. And in the US, the Biden administration recently also set a target um, of 80% renewable energy generation by 2030. Um, so clearly there's some great um, political movement happening, um, and Chile is poised to be a, a leader regionally and, and globally in uh, renewable energy, um, and it has a lot of natural or natural resources that that will help with it, and and also a, a really, I think, um, rich history of environmentalism and um, kind of climate organizing. But from the lens of the electricity grid we have to ask, so what does this transformation mean for how the future electricity grid will work? And how can we ensure that the grid is ready for this big change up we're gonna, we're gonna need to make? Um, so I wanted to start super basic. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but um, the grid is not just a, a source of electrons. But we can kind of think of it as like a, an oscillating machine that needs to be kept in harmony. And we kind of, at some level, are aware of this when we come to a different country and we're like, oh, like what adapter do we need? You know, <laughs> what does it mean that it's like 50 hertz here um, and not 60 hertz? And, and I'm actually grateful Makoto gave us a primer on electromagnetic waves because, you know, that's what you're doing when you're plugging in your phone is you're tapping into like the electromagnetic wave um, that is the entire grid. Um, and that is all, this entire grid is kind of, is oscillating at, at 50 hertz. And so to, to keep this in harmony um, really means balancing load and, and generation. So we can kind of think of it as a, a scale where every kind of second of every day, 24 seven, we need to have a balance of um, supply and demand because electricity is kind of, you know, moves kind of nearly instantaneously. And so um, you can't just kind of leave some in the transmission line for use later. Um, you need it to, to always be uh, balancing. 
And the key is that when you have um, this balance, you'll have a stable frequency of 50 hertz. But um, the stability of, of the grid staying at 50 hertz um, depends on that balance. Um, and so, you know, we actually have people and, well, mainly computers now operating the grid 24-7, uh, um, and they use algorithms to kind of continuously predict, try to predict changes in load, and then respond to the changes they're seeing by, by finding the most optimal way to, to balance generation to meet the change in load. Um, and obviously, you know, in addition to, you know, trying, to, trying our best to balance um, generation and load, we also need to recognize that, you know, things break, you know, like things go wrong and we want a grid that, um, you know, we can call resilient, meaning that if something fails, that it won't, you know, immediately cascade into a, a blackout or an outage. Um, and, you know, this risk is, is um, kind of, can happen on really short timescales where even short imbalances, if you have a, if the imbalance is big and you have a weak grid, um, it could risk the whole system kind of cascading um, into a blackout. And that's why it's, you know, lights might not just go out in one area, but might go out in the whole grid because it is this connected, you know, oscillating machine. Um, and of course, it's more than just, you know, pouring some sand into one end of a, a scale. Um, you know, the, the grid itself is, is really complex and, um, and has a lot of dynamics um, between different areas of the grid. Um, as you can see here from this part of the northern Chile's grid, you've got a lot of different types of lines and, and connections um, and you have, you know, people using electricity in the cities and it being generated, you know, by solar panels out in the desert. Um, and so the, the point I wanted to drive home is that the, the stability of the grid varies by area. And so this is getting back to uh, what I mentioned in the, in the summary slide of, of a weak area of the grid. Um, and a weak area of the grid is an area that's more susceptible to frequency variation. So a, a smaller disturbance, you know, or uh, some fuse blowing um, could have a, a bigger effect on the stability of the entire system or of that area of the grid and have a bigger effect on system frequency. Um, so how, how do we make sure the grid is um, resilient today? And... The answer is that today, a lot of our resiliency or the strength of the grid comes inherently from the fact that we that we use a lot of fossil fuel generation. So, you know, gas plants are like the gas engine in your car, basically, but just on a much bigger scale. And they have these, you know, big turbines that are basically giant hunks of metal spinning at the, the frequency of the grid. Um, and so since these are physical giant spinning chunks of metal, they have a physical inertia, right? Like they're gonna wanna keep spinning even if um, you pull a little, try to pull a little more energy from them or, or give them a little less. Um, and so if there's a disturbance or if you have an imbalance where suddenly you try to use a lot more energy, the, these giant generators are gonna help the grid stay uh, stable and stay kind of consistent throughout. But obviously these are bad for our climate goals and we need to get rid of them and so we need to figure out how to keep the grid stable without them. Um, and, you know, renewables are a really um, great technology for replacing the energy that we get from fossil fuel plants, um, particularly here, here in Chile, like we have the best um, solar resources in the world, in the Atacama Desert, um, and which is up in the north. And you also have um, some great wind resources throughout the country, namely in the, the south. Um, and so when we look at the kind of future of Chile's renewable uh, portfolio, 
it's probably going to have a lot of solar in the north and a lot of wind in the south. Um, and then in addition to be, these being very far apart, what we see on the, the left here is an example of a daily uh, profile of power output from solar and wind. And so this yellow line is solar and you can see, you know, we know it's going to, you know, follow the sun's path throughout the course of the day, but within the middle of the day, you can't really know when a cloud's going to be in this spot when. And so, you know, you're going to have some ups and downs in the, in what you're getting from the solar. And similarly, you know, no one can exactly predict the wind speed at a, at a point. So you're going to have some variation, um, which is okay, except that it makes, you know, this challenge of exactly balancing supply and demand harder instead of easier. Um, and then you have these two that are going to be pulling on or injecting into the opposite ends of the grid. And so this is all going to be, I think, a lot more difficult than, uh, to balance than just having you know, an even array of fossil fuel plants balanced and hydroelectric electric balanced without. Um, and of course, you're probably thinking of batteries because they're the, the hot new thing in energy and, and they're definitely going to be a, a critical thing, critical technology for storing this clean energy during the day um, for use when we need it, um, when the sun's, sun stops shining or the wind stops blowing. Um, and that kind of helps with evening out the energy supply over the course of the day. But um, critically for um, stability and, and my project is that batteries can also be designed to support grid stability by responding kind of autonomously to contingencies and, and momentary imbalances. And they're already doing this to some extent today. Um, but the technology is, is very new. Um, and kind of rapidly evolving. And so um, it, it kind of really depends on uh, the battery and the technology and the location. And the kind of key here is that, you know, unlike fossil fuel generators, which we, you know, do this inherently where they help the grid stay stable, batteries need to be designed for this functionality. Um, and it need to be you know, planned and designed and operated kind of more um, specifically with this in mind. Um, so that leads me to kind of the the the, um, the punch the the conclusion of of all these trends is that you know we're going to need in order to have a, a clean grid we're going to need uh, more advanced tools and models to maintain a, a stable power supply, which leads us to the, the work that Professor Rahman is, is doing at uh, the University of Chile and the work I hope to, to join. Um, so the solution more generally is, is enhancing the planning and operational tools that grid operators use. You know, we, they use tools to figure out what resources to build in five years and they also use models to help them figure out what are we going to need in a week and what are we going to need in an hour and what are we going to need in two seconds. Um, and so even within all of these operational tools, we need to, to kind of introduce the complexity of, of renewables and, and batteries. And um, Professor Rahman has already started doing a lot of this work and um, I'm hoping to, to learn a lot from her um, on the kind of more the engineering analysis she does to, to identify weaker areas of the grid and, and input that information into planning and uh, optimization tools um, in order to help grid operators decide the, the most effective solutions. Um, and then where I'm kind of specifically focusing my project is in the kind of the input assumptions for batteries within this tool um, because like all models, you know, we know that the output is only as good as the input, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And so if you aren't able to represent the, the physical world as accurately in your inputs, it's going to make it harder to, to trust your outputs and, and harder for the grid operators to, to use the, the product. And so 
batteries, like I mentioned, are, are really a, a rapidly evolving technology, and the technology for how to set them up to have a more um, automatic or inherent uh, frequency response is is also kind of coming just like now at the stage in the in the game, and so. Um, I'm going to be trying to use, you know, what I've learned from working in California, where we have a, basically like a 4,000 percent increase in the amount of batteries on our grid in the last like two years, um, and you know things are are promising but chaotic, and you know I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from what's happened in California, um, and then um, also do some research into the the most kind of recent R&D um, in battery technology today. Um, and then learn from, as I mentioned, Professor Raman about how she set up her model um, and these inputs <coughs> and, and see if we can Im improve the, the accuracy of, of how we're modeling batteries in these, um, in these models. Um, that's where I'm going to leave it. So thank you. <laughs>